here on Stillwater 360, we'll provide you news you need to know three days a week in 60 seconds about the city of Stillwater. This is your March 2nd Stillwater 360. Is your family or community group looking for a service project idea? The city is now accepting signups for its annual trash off on Saturday, March 26th. The city asks that you RSVP by Friday, March 18th with the number of people in your group. The city will provide work gloves, safety vests, and trash bags for, participa for participants and will host a hot dog lunch after the cleanup. To sign up, call 405-533-8482. Find more info about the trash off at stillwater.org. Also, since it's election season again, we'd like to remind you that temporary signage like campaign signs may not be placed on public property, including city parks or public structures like traffic signals, utility poles, or bus shelters. You can place signs on your rights of way of your private property unless it faces state highways. This includes 6th Avenue and Perkins Road. More information about temporary signs code compliance is on our website. There's your news in 60 seconds. Have a great day, Stillwater. The City of Stillwater would like to remind residents that temporary signs are only allowed in certain places within city limits. Temporary signs are signs that are not permanently attached to the ground and are displayed for a limited period of time. These include campaign signs, real estate signs, garage sale signs, balloons and parking bumpers. Signs may not be placed on public property, such as city parks or public structures. These include traffic signs, utility poles and bus shelters. Temporary signs are not allowed along state highways rights of way by state law. Rights of way are public sidewalks in the space between a sidewalk and the curb. This includes State Highway 51, 6th Avenue, and U.S. Highway 177, Perkins Road, which run through city limits. Signs placed along these highways will be removed by city staff. Do not place temporary signs on private property without the owner's permission. If a sign is placed on your private property without permission, you may remove it. Property owners may put signs on their property facing rights of way unless they face 6th Avenue or Perkins Road. For more information, contact the City of Stillwater Department of Development Service at 405-742-8220 or email news at stillwater.org. The best way to find out if the City of Stillwater is hiring is to check out our website at stillwater.org slash employment. On our website, you can find each opening has a link where you can find the full job description, the minimum requirements, the salary, and some scheduling information. We post all of our open positions, whether they're full-time, part-time, or our seasonal positions, online at stillwater.org slash employment. After you apply, we'll notify you if you've been selected for an interview. Moving forward, our new software update will allow us to keep you advised of each step in the process. Make sure that when you're checking our job board, you respond with all required materials, such as application, resume, and cover letter if needed. We only accept applications for open positions. Make sure you hit our deadline. It'll be listed and it's 5 p.m. on the closing date list.
Whether you are shopping, dining, or doing business in Stillwater, we would like to take the opportunity to let you know about public parking in three areas around Stillwater, Downtown Stillwater, Campus Corner, and the Strip on Washington Street. In these areas, many of the free city parking spots, mostly in the street, are timed. Time ranges from 30 minutes to 3 hours Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., and these spaces are not timed on weekends and city-recognized holidays. The purpose for these timed parking spots is to give everyone equal opportunity to a parking space, which is not only good for other people visiting these areas, but is a benefit to the businesses in these areas as well. Now, say for instance you are cited for overtime parking as you are inside a business. Well, instead of paying the $10 citation, you can easily bring it back to one of more than 200 businesses in these three areas to have the ticket validated. All you have to do is give them the ticket and that's it. They will take care of the rest. For more information about public parking spaces, the validation program, or tickets, call the municipal court at the city of Stillwater at 405 745 in and out. What? 745 in and out. In your dreams. Hey. Hey. No, I'm only at three, so in and out. Oh! <laughs> Tonight, four, I hope. Oh, you haven't even got to the best part. I know, I know, don't you, but, uh, did you start blood line? Oh, uh, no, we looked at it, but. Okay. Good evening. We have a full house tonight. We like to see that. Welcome to the March 7th City Council meeting. I call it to order. And we... Is our pledge leader here. I apologize for not finding you earlier. His name is Keegan. Keegan, are you here? Okay, well, we're all going to be pledge leaders then. Would you all stand and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. Thank you. <coughs> that takes us to proclamations and presentations, and we have two proclamations tonight. One for the Stillwater Public Library. So would you please come forward? And the next one will be the Demolay. Okay, here we go. Whereas reading is the foundation of education for people of all ages, and whereas reading for enjoyment and enlightenment can enrich the lives of individuals, and whereas the arts are a vital component of everyday life, allowing Americans to expand their horizons as thinkers and citizens in a world of complex ideas and technologies, and whereas the city received a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts and support from the Stillwater Public Library Trust, Stillwater Public Library Friends, and OSU Library Friends for our eighth community-wide reading event. And whereas the spring 2016 community read will foster a sense of community through a shared arts and reading experience of two novels that explore two very different views of the 1920s America and Oklahoma. And whereas the city of Stillwater is collaborating with the Sherrard Museum of Stillwater History, Mount Zion Church, Town and Gown, Oklahoma State University Library, and many other community and university partners to present this series. So now, therefore, be it resolved that the Stillwater City Council hereby encourages all community members to participate in two books, one community, The Great Gatsby and Fire of Beulah, by reading and discussing these novels and attending programs and exhibits during March and a April. Thank you very much. 
and uh, would you like to address the city council? Thank you. Thank you all um, again for your continued support of our community reading events and we uh, kick off this series tomorrow. So at noon at the library will be our first kickoff event where we will have um, Dr. Vassar from NSU come and give us kind of an overview of our two novels, The Great Gatsby and Fire and Beulah. Uh, Fire and Beulah is a lesser known novel um, than The Great Gatsby and it is about the 1921 Tulsa race riot. So we are um, encouraging people to learn more about that event um, in Oklahoma's history as well as reading The Great Gatsby. And then at 7 p.m. tomorrow evening, um, you can come to Brooklyn's, to the cellar, uh, which is where we're having our speakeasy event. And we will be giving away copies of the books at both of the events. And we have many, many other events scheduled. Um, more information is at the Stillwater Library's uh, website. And we'll have brochures to give out um, at our kickoff event. So thank you very much for the proclamation and your support. Okay, the, proclama the proclamation, whereas the Order of the Malay is a premier youth organization dedicated to teaching young men to, better to be better persons and leaders, and whereas leadership skills, civic awareness, responsibility, and character development are learned through a variety of self-directed real-world applications and activities, building confidence, teaching responsibility, cooperation, and community service, and fostering trust, respect, fellowship, patriotism, reverence, and sharing, and whereas Demolay has carried out the aforementioned for 97 years, and the Stillwater chapter has served the community of Stillwater since 1921, and whereas in March of 2016, citizens of Stillwater will join with the members of Demolay to celebrate the 97th anniversary of the Order of Demolay. Now, therefore, I, Gina J. Noble, Mayor of the City of Stillwater, Oklahoma, do hereby proclaim March as Demolay Month in Stillwater. You're welcome. And would you like to address the yes, council? Okay. Good evening, uh, Mayor Noble and the council members. My name is Sean Stewart, and I'm Master Counselor for the winter term of Stillwater's Demolay Chapter. Um, on my right is the most recent Master Counselor, Walker Euler, Senior Deacon, Jonathan Spiva, my Junior Counselor, Isaac Spiva, my Senior Counselor, David McCurry, and my brother, Scott Stewart. Um, we would like to thank not only the council, but the entire community of Stillwater for your continued support. Um, we work closely with the Wings of Hope and the Humane Society here in the community and hope to give back even more to this community that has meant so much to Stillwater Chapter. Um, some upcoming events that we have on April 24th is our next installation of officers where David will be installed as Master Counselor. Um, on November 19th, we have a Battle of the Bands happening at Stillwater Community Center. Um, again, thank you guys so much for your support and the entirety of the community of Stillwater. Um, have a good evening. Right, that takes us to the consent docket. Counselors, does anyone wish to remove an item or is there a motion to approve? Motion to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the March 7th consent docket. Please vote. And the consent docket is approved with a vote of five to zero.
Yeah. We're, no, we're okay. okay. They're all listed. <laughs> that takes us to. Congratulations. Oh, sorry. I was saying congratulations because we approved his contract. Thank you. Yes. We did. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> That takes us to public comment on agenda items not scheduled for public hearing. I don't have anything. Patty, I don't have anything. Okay. Okay, so we're going to move on from that one and go to item number seven public hearings. Receive public comment regarding the contract acceptance and close of the 2013 community development. Paula, I told you not to do that. I'm just trying to be like you, Mayor. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> That's touchy. Community Development Block Grant Project. Request council acceptance of the 15655 CDBG 13 project and authorize the mayor to sign the closeout documents. Mr. Dorman, did we have good notice on this item? Yes, ma'am. Mr. McNichol. Uh, Director of uh, Community Services, uh, Paula Dennison, will be community development. I'll get this right one of these days. Whoever I am. Um, <laughs> yes, sir. We'll present <laughs> the report. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council, Mr. Manager and Mr. Attorney. We do have a closeout of our uh, 2013 Community Development Block Grant application. This was a storm drainage, uh, two projects actually. One was at Stone Gate, which had a new culvert installed to reduce flooding in that area. And the other was at 19th and Sanger. As you can see, the lime green line, about 550 feet of storm sewer culvert repair um, is what occurred at 19th and Sanger. In total, there were 122 properties that are served with just these two projects. And that also comes to 247 direct beneficiaries who are getting the benefit of these projects. The Stonegate design was done by Olson Associates and the contractor North Central Construction. 19th and Sanger, the contractor was ProShock Concrete. All of the funds, you can see the total there, just over 210,000 were expended, and the breakdowns, the 19th and Sanger, the 53,000 and change, and then the Stonegate, um, almost 158,000. So this is a public hearing, and I will be happy to address any questions now or after anyone has an opportunity to speak. Councilors, any questions now? No. Okay. At this time, I will open the public hearing, but we don't have anyone to speak on that, so I will close the public hearing and uh, ask Ms. Dennison for her recommendations. Our recommendation is to approve the project, accept it, and authorize the mayor to sign the closeout doc documents that we have. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve. Let me get back to CC-16-26. Please vote. And that is approved with a vote of 5 to 0. That takes us to item B, receive public comment regarding a request for a specific use permit for property addressed as 3014 South Main Street to allow a health and social assistance use in the RTM two-family and multi-family residential zoning district, CC-16-25. Mr. Dorman, did we have good notice on this item? Yes, ma'am. We actually used the notice under 11 OS 43106, which requires the quarter mile radius instead of the 300 foot because it's a, it, it is a type of use that uh, would involve rehabilitation services and uh, things of that nature. So. Uh, we have used that and we have published in accordance with the state statute. Okay, thank you. Mr. McNichol. And Ms. Dennison will provide this report as well. Yes, good evening again and thank you. This is a specific use permit for um, anyone in the audience or viewing audience may know it as the Gatesway property on South Main Street, south of town. 
The property is currently zoned RTM, which is the residential two-family and multifamily zoning district. As you can see, it is in the uh, highlighted and hatched area. It's adjacent to RSS, which is the small lot single family. It's adjacent to agriculture. And on the south and immediate east side, it is actually adjacent to unincorporated area, which is also unzoned. This is an aerial view of the property. The facility um, is still there. It has been vacant. The last action that um, has been requested to the city of Stillwater in 2005, there was a request to rezone the property um, for personal storage. Prior to that, it was used as a group home and a nursing home type facility. So there has not been a lot of active use on the property in a number of years. But this is an aerial view. You can see that um, there is some development that has occurred around the facility, but there's also a lot of <coughs> under and unutilized land in the area. With a specific use permit, um, the <coughs> commission did hear this at their, their meeting, and they um, actually had a lot of positive input from the public. Staff has not received any uh, word of anyone in opposition. Usually when we have something like this, if there is opposition, the folks come, or sometimes if they cannot attend, they provide documentation to be distributed to the council, and we have not received any of that. Uh, the specific use permit does allow any um, conditions to be placed on the ability to use this property in the manner as requested, such as fencing, uh, placement, lighting, direction of the lighting, any parking or anything like that. There are representatives here of Teen Challenge who will be addressing what their proposal is for your information. But at this time, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have of me. Will you go back to the zoning map? When were the apartments built, do you know? The apartments have been out there decades. Okay. They were redone in approximately 2006, 2007 ish, okay. and there was tax credits used to redo okay. the apartments. And then the, so the building's been vacant since then? Since Practically, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other que questions right now? Okay, at this time I will open public hearings and we do have speakers for this. And I would like to remind the speakers that you have three minutes to speak and make sure you stay on topic. And uh, when you come up, please say your name and your address. Did I cover everything, Mr. Dorman? They have five minutes, sorry. Okay, since you're walking forward, Mr. Buchanan, I will call yours first. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. I appreciate that. I know I told you two minutes a My while ago. My name is Richard Buchanan. I believe all of you know me, but if you don't, that's who I am. I live at 417 South Orchard. This will probably... <clears throat> be the shortest speech that you ever hear come forth from my, from my mouth. <laughs> I'm here tonight speaking to you on behalf of the trustees of the First United Methodist Church. We own the RSS property to the north <clears throat> on which we have, and you, do you have it? No, you've got away with it. But <clears throat> we own the property that's to the north that shares a contiguous property boundary with the property that's the subject of the rezoning. Uh, it is, most of you will recognize immediately when I say that it is the community storehouse. It is a food distribution center that uh, distributes food to those who are indigent uh, as, as we receive from the regional food bank and some very gracious national retailers that I will not mention. And <clears throat> we feel like, we feel like that this is absolutely the best thing that has happened out there in probably 20 years. Finally, that piece of property is going to be put to a social enterprise use that is consistent with the area, that, that will do some good for somebody. Thus far, until now, it has simply sat there. 
at times it has been, as the chief could, well, the city manager now, it has been a problem with some derelicts from time to time. It will not be that anymore. So I think my three minutes is up. I'm not going to use all five of them because I have somewhere else I'm supposed to be. It's very gracious of you. We only gave you two, I thought. Isn't that right? <laughs> <laughs> we supported. We roughly 1,600 members of the First United Methodist Church think it's a good deal. There it is. Thank you, Mr. Buchanan, and now you can make your other meeting, I hope. Okay. All right, our next speaker is Wayne Gray. Mr. Gray? That's okay, you have five minutes. That'll keep me on Would you like on uh, that's okay. <clears throat> then the camera doesn't vote for you. Can you turn it? I can't yeah. see it unless the camera's going to go in on. Yeah, I don't, they don't vote, so there. He didn't hear it. Yeah. My name is um, That's good. Um, my name is Wayne Gray, and I am the state director of Team Challenge of Oklahoma. And my address is 1524 West Wellington Way, Mustang, Oklahoma. And we have six programs around the state for adolescent boys, uh, adolescent girls, adult men, and adult women. We have a seventh program currently being open inside of Lawton Correctional Institute. We are not traditional treatment, we are faith-based recovery. We are a Christian program. We help people with their problems, life controlling issues such as drugs and alcohol uh, by teaching them Christian principles. So we're not the 12 step traditional treatment. Uh, there are several things that a lot of the people would be concerned about and uh, instead of talking about how successful we are, I will address some of the concerns that you may have or that some people in the community may have. First one on there is our clients, they do live with us. It is a residential program. We do not allow them to have use of cars. They will not be able to come and go. Once they check in, they live there. When we go out, we go out as a group. And so they will not be able to come and go as they please. Secondly, they're not even allowed to leave the property. It's again, they are checking themselves in. It's not locked down, but once they check themselves into our program, they have to stay there. If they leave, they dismiss themselves from the program. Uh, if they want to leave, they have to come see a staff member because we keep their luggage locked up. So any concerns the neighbors might have about people coming and going, getting their bags, roaming through the neighborhoods, uh, anything like that, we do not allow that. When they want to leave, we allow them to make a phone call and uh, usually a family member will come pick them up or we will take them to a bus station and get them a ticket out of town. Uh, but most people have someone come and pick them up. And again, they can't just leave on their own unless they leave all their stuff with us if they decide to leave. Uh, we do not take registered sex offenders. We do not take violent offenders. And all clients are uh, supervised at all times. By, we have live-in staff. There have the people that will actually live on the property. So it's not a come and go type thing. It's not a halfway house uh, where people will be uh, going out and working a job and coming back in, that kind of thing. It is faith-based, residential, faith-based recovery services, um, and it is not a halfway house or a traditional type of treatment. And just to let you know, we have the six programs. We are right in the middle of town of uh, Chicota, Oklahoma. We are on Main Street in Sepulpa, Oklahoma, and right in the heart of Oklahoma City in Southwest Oklahoma City. So we, we have some rural programs, but we do also have some right up in the middle of town. And uh, we get along with all folks and we feel like we, we have something to, to offer the community uh, as, as well. So uh, did that in three minutes. Uh, if you have any questions for me, I'd be more than happy to answer them. You might have said it, but how many students do you expect to have on site? Um, right now, we're probably, we're thinking about 40, possibly up to 50. Ages? It'll be adult males, okay. 18 and over. Okay. Mr. Gray, how long do they normally stay with you? What's the length? They come in the program. They uh, are committing to a minimum of one year in the program. It's about one year to 14 months. Wow. 
I'm wondering, Mr. Gray, with the 40 to 50 expected um, residents, what would be your number of staff? Well, we would probably have 10 or 12 staff, but live on the property, we would have four or five at all times. Okay. I, I'm just thinking about parking. Sure. And, uh, you, uh, of course, our residents won't be allowed right. to have cars. Right. But So you would have um, 10, 12, 15? Vehicles. Mm -hmm. Okay. There. Well, it, we'll have vans that for shuttling them to, you know, if we go to church or if we go in mm -hmm. uh, to the community or something. And, and, and there's stuff. adequate parking there. I drove by and it looked like there was enough space for that. We believe so, yes. Mm -hmm. You said that you have something to contribute to the community. What do you contribute? Well, first off, we'll fix the place up and it'll look a, not, a lot nicer. And, um, and then, you know, we're there to help people. We'll be a place where people can come in and uh, if they want to check in our program and they live in this community, they're having issues with drug or alcohol, they come out and uh, uh, we will screen them for the program. If they feel like they can't stay here because it's too much temptation to stay here, then we have the other programs around the state that we can place them. If they feel like, hey, you know, I'm ready for the problem. I want to live here, and, and, and it's not going to be a problem for me going home. Then they just move right in with us. So we will help the community address some of the needs with people uh, uh, that are struggling with life control controlling issues, especially in addiction. Any other questions, Councilor? I, I, I have one question. Um, you do say that uh, you don't take violent offenders, and I'm wondering how you uh, define violent offenders. Well, it, well, we define about someone who's committed a violent crime, uh, armed robbery, uh, strong armed robbery, uh, obviously, you know, injuring someone that way. We do background checks on it on everyone mm -hmm. uh, before they come in. But we do take people there that, that will have some type of record some, at times, not everybody, felony record, but it's usually they have broken the law to support their habit, stolen something so they could sell it, get money, do drugs. So um, not, the, but not even half the people that come in our programs are falling under that, but there will always be a percentage of them there with some kind of felony record. Mm -hmm. but, but again, we screen them for sex offenders and violent offenders. Is this a lockdown facility? You say that they don't not aren't allowed to leave the property. It's not lockdown, and obviously they come in. We screen them. They may say they want to be in the program. We screen them, and we don't feel like they're ready or whatever. But once we screen them, they're invited into our program. Then they say you're here to stay. Uh, if you leave the property, you're di you've dismissed yourself. So that it's a lockdown in in that sense. They, if they wander off the property, then come back and get your stuff or keep walking, which, uh, and that's kind of the rule. So that's why we say they're not allowed to leave. But as far as okay, locking so, them up at night. But there is a, there's a neighborhood next to this, yes. correct? Mm -hmm. So what assurances can you give the neighborhood for someone's not gonna leave and walk in the neighborhood? Well, I know you said that earlier. Obviously some of the things I've said, when someone, I mean, I'm not gonna sit here and say people haven't walked off of our property, but they usually have somewhere in mind they want to go. And uh, if they do leave the property and leave their luggage behind and leave all their belongings behind, they usually uh, have somewhere in mind that they're going. We really haven't had any issues with people roaming through the neighborhood. And again, I told you we are up in some very busy areas of some communities here in Oklahoma City. And um, so that the assurances that we are there in communities in Oklahoma and we really haven't had any issues and that's because number one we screen them as best we can uh, when coming in and then the things I just said and uh, that we help them if they made up their mind they want to leave we help them to leave so that that doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. One more question it's always exciting to hear someone say they're going to move into the neighborhood and make it look better. Um, do you have plans for fencing or landscape, uh, particularly between um, your property and the apartments the apartment. to the side? Yes, we would uh, like to put a privacy fence up there um, for both for us and for them. And so I guess if the city allows that, I'll, you know, obviously with that, but that's what our plans would be. And obviously I, 
I got a before and an after just to let you know when we come in, we'll clean up the place and clean the landscape. And see, the thing is, we have, we have that many people living with us. We got a lot of labor and our places <laughs> look nice. And just to let you know, I'm really, really particular. So I come on property, I start fussing about things. You know, I like them neatly and in order. And uh, we like to have uh, a neat appearance. And if you can go around our sites or even go on our website and see some of our properties. Uh, as well. So, uh, yes, we will definitely improve the properties, and we do have a plan to put the fence up between us and the apartments. Okay. The, the entire uh, length of, um, it, it's, it's hard to tell from the, from that overhead picture. Yeah. Um, that one wing comes out to the, to <clears throat> the southeast, and it would go all the way from, um, what are you thinking from? Well, I was thinking from just from, from down to the street there. Okay. Up. All the way to the other street okay and uh, in the back and that would be a privacy fence for both of us because you know obviously we don't want to bother our neighbors and we don't want them to come over mm -hmm. bother us either I guess so back and forth so there's some the kind of boundaries the south and up from north to south in the back you're talking about or just I, I, I missed where I don't have my directions yeah Right with me, okay. but the where the property adjoins, there are the the uh, apartments are. Okay, right. Yeah, that that whole line there we were thinking of. A okay. Privacy. Fence. Okay. Um, both of us. I know you're thinking about it. it we will put one up. Well, you will put. Yes. Could, is, is that an appropriate thing to request in this? I think I when it's, yeah, it's an SUP, so it seems that. Health conditions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, Councilor Weaver. What I'm wondering about the clientele are do you do you envision serving this community? Absolutely, we'll serve the community by being there. I mean, we have people that come out. We counsel families. We counsel uh, people in the community that they need that are thinking or wanting help, needing help. Um, and again, we kind of leave it up to the, the individual. If they say, I need a long-term residential program, uh, I need your program. If they're from right here in Stillwater, we usually give them the option. Do you really feel like you can stay in this program for a year, knowing that we're going to be driving through town and, and all? Or if, if you don't feel like that, it, we have other programs, we can place you in one of our other programs. And it's been, it's been a practice. We usually have a little of both. We've had people come in our programs and just live right down the street. They were so ready for help that um, uh, they stayed. We've had other people say, I'll quit if I stay in this, if I live, stay in this community, I'll probably just leave. I need to get away and we can get them to one of our other male men's facilities. We have one in the Lawton area, one in Oklahoma City, and then one in the Tulsa area in Sepulpa, so we can get them a few hours away. Do you see collaborating with the entities that are already here in Stillwater? Um, I know you're a faith-based program, so do you see collaborating with all the churches here in Stillwater and collaborating with other entities or are you more of a standalone? No, we would, uh, we would obviously do that. A lot of our, uh, a lot of our clients that come in our programs are referred from churches of, of all denominations. And uh, we actually go in and do services and have some of our people give testimony of how their lives have changed. We do that all over the state. Uh, every, every Sunday we, and during the week, we get involved in other different things like some of the, some of the areas we are, they'll have support groups like Celebrate Recovery and things like that, which is a Christian support group. We'll, we'll actually get involved in that. And we, we, one of the things we want to do is help to start more kind of outpatient recovery. It's the next push that we're on where we, we start support groups of our own and where we can help people. Because not everybody needs to come into a program, but a lot of people need that support. So that's another way we would give back. We've had an issue with um, other building um, and lights and next to a neighborhood. Do you, will you have extra lighting around the property that, that might interfere with the apartment? Uh, I don't think we would have it to that extent. Obviously we would want some lights, you know, to uh, light up the parking lot and up right around the buildings and all, but I don't, I don't see that being an issue. And obviously we would comply with whatever the city would tell us to do. Okay. Anybody else? Thank you very much, Mr. Gray. Okay, at this time I will close the public hearing.
and ask Ms. Dennison to come back. <coughs> is there a recommendation? Yes, the Planning Commission is sending a recommendation of approval as the project plan is presented. And that is a 6-0 vote. Okay. May I request a privacy fence be included as a uh, part of the exception? Absolutely. That's, that's one of the specific things that the SUP allowance uh, identifies as a condition. As well, I would like to request lighting, but uh, lighting that doesn't interfere, that does light up the parking lot, but does not interfere with the other neighbors or that. No light intrusion off site. Mm -hmm. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Mayor? Yes. I would uh, move to approve this item with those two uh, amendments to the what came to us from Planning Commission. I really. I see a great value in bringing that site back to a good purpose and a good use. And there's a part of me, well, no, not a part of me, a big part of me that thinks that a community is judged by how we take care of people that might not be in the same position we are, maybe you're a little, little broken and need some repair. And so I think this sounds like a pretty good program and it's worth pursuing and I move approval. I'd like, before we do that, sorry, I'd, I'd like to just make a comment. Um, I don't know how to say this without getting too in depth, but where'd the gentleman go right there? Um, I had a, several family members that dealt with addiction, mostly drugs, a lot of alcohol too, and I grew up very poor and I grew up in apartment complexes and things. And one of my major concerns is I know a lot about addicts and I also know a lot about living in apartments and especially with those kids, I'm just very concerned with this facility being next to an apartment complex. and. Um, I, you know, I, I do agree with Joe, we should take care of our community, we should help those. I mean, we're, I think every single person on this council is, is a believer, and so I don't think it's about that, but I just, I'm concerned with the, the placement of it. I, I don't wanna deny it though, but I'd really like to see, and I don't know, maybe if you could work with our planning commission about some protection, whether that be a privacy fence around a good portion of it, but still have access, obviously, we don't want it to look like prison, but still be able for a little more protection. And I'd like lights along the privacy fence, and I would even probably go as far to say as getting some sort of trees or something planted. I know you said you've got a lot of people that can probably do some sort of landscape. Just something that puts a little more added protection in between that, and that way, you know, I, I just, it's hard for me for a person who's been in that scenario and knows a lot of those people. I mean, I definitely feel for them and they need help. There's no question. Um, I just want to make sure we're not overlooking the people already there when we're helping others. So. I don't know. So I, I, I agree with the motion of privacy fence. I would like to see it along that back edge as well as that. I think is that 32nd, Paula, right there? Yeah, right. Uh, is that 32nd facing the empty field other way? I'm sorry. This is Maine. This is husband. Right there. I, I'd like to see maybe some fencing there as well. Then, so that would be on the south and the west sides? Yes. Yeah. And are you talking about a six foot privacy fence? Yeah. Yeah. Just and then, for clarification. And then for some, I know with this, these type of things, we could request certain vegetation be planted. So some, some sort of brush, maybe a certain feet apart every, you know, seven feet or ten feet or something just something to put a little more there and then I would second uh, <coughs> Councilor Weaver's motion with the subject to what I have added <coughs> I don't know if I can do it since I added things. <laughs> I accept your <laughs> <laughs> all right we have a motion you have a motion in a second you haven't spoken it yet so he can it without having to go through the formal process. Okay, so <laughs> who needs the motion? We, is, as I understand it, would be to approve this with yes, with fencing, with adequate lighting and fencing, adequate lighting and fencing along the south and west sides, and with uh, some form of vegetative buffering. Yeah, along which sides? 
the south and west. South and west yeah. sides. Okay, so fencing, lighting, vegetative buffering, motion and a second to approve. Please vote. Do we vote again? No. It, it, no. it passed. It passed. Okay. So with a vote of five to zero, the SUP passed with a the SUP passed. So that moves us to our next item. Item C proposed increment district number two, City of Stillwater and Stillwater West fifty one development district project plan public hearing. Public hearing and presentation of the, of the proposed increment district number two, City of Stillwater and Stillwater West 51 Development District Project Plan for the purpose of providing the citizens and other interested parties an opportunity for questions and answers regarding the proposed increment district, district and project plan. Mr. Dorman, did we have good notice on this item? Yes, we published in, uh, in accordance with the uh, state statute Actually, we published notice on both uh, hearings, the hearing tonight and the hearing on the 21st. Okay. <laughs> Mr. McNichol. Um, I believe Mr. Dorman's going to provide the first part of that presentation. Where's the, I'm going to go ahead and kick it off. Is that how you want to do it? Okay. Uh, very quickly, um, I just need to run over the statutory basis for this. I, I know that you have... Uh, some of you have already been through this process once, and uh, <clears throat> obviously Councilman Weaver has heard this twice now since he's uh, been on the TIF committee. But um, just very briefly, I thought it would be good to, to kind of run over the rules, for lack of a better term. Uh, TIF districts are authorized by Article 10, Subsection 6 of the Oklahoma Constitution, which authorizes the use of incentives, exemptions, and other forms of relief from taxation to stimulate economic development in areas exhibiting economic stagnation or decline. And in conjunction with this uh, constitutional amendment that was approved back in the late uh, 1990s, uh, there was the Oak legislature adopted the Local Development Act, uh, which is found in Title 62 of Oklahoma statutes. And the Local Development Act basically creates the tools that can be used to, uh, used to create tax increment financing and things of that nature. Um, and uh, so anyways, basically what the, LD, the Local Development Act does is it authorizes the use of tax recruitment financing to stimulate economic development in areas meeting the constitutional criteria. Uh, tax increment financing allows the city to direct the apportionment of certain local taxes to, to finance what are known as public project costs. And uh, the most common form of TIF utilizes a portion or an increment of ad valorem taxes produced by the increased uh, value of property. Another kind of TIF uh, uses a portion of new sales tax revenue generated within the, uh, the TIF district. Uh, you can have TIF districts that do both, use both ad valorem and sales tax. Uh, it's kind of up to the city council which one works best uh, for the community. Uh, so anyways, uh, you have a lot of flexibility as to how you want to do that. Uh, the, the most recently adopted TIF, and actually the one and only TIF in Stillwater is the one on North Perkins Road that you approved back in 2014. That is the sales tax exclusive TIF. And uh, as you will learn later this evening, that's essentially what's being proposed here. Uh, the tax increment financing district is established by the development and approval of a project plan. And the project plan basically specifies the boundaries and objectives of a project area. And, uh, or what we call an increment district. Uh, the project plan authorizes the types of projects that can be carried out in furtherance of the stated objectives. Uh, it, it determines the estimated project costs and it establishes the method and sources of financing that would be authorized in a TIF district. Um, the process is fairly straightforward and I won't go through all of that, but 
basically you've already done part of it and that is you established by resolution uh, an intent to establish a TIF district and uh, through that resolution you establish an area that, that you ask a review committee to study to see if that is a suitable location for a tax increment financing uh, area. Uh, then you also select a, you create a review committee, which you did. Uh, the review committee consists of a member of the council, a member of the planning commission, uh, a member of city, of city staff, and then they select uh, three members from the public at large. Let me jump on you there, John, just a little bit. The the council should know that we had a very active committee. We had three of the members sitting in the room, Roger Ghost, Russell Bass, John Bartley, Kay Heath, and Dusty Lane. It was a very active committee with lively discussion. I mean, it was, it was really a pleasure to work with this group, and I think they've got you a pretty good work product here. So I commend those folks for attending a lot of meetings, spending a lot of time, putting up with the city attorney, and uh, being here tonight. And Councillor Weaver, you were there also, right? I was. Yeah, okay. In fact, you led this group. Well, I, I couldn't make the last two meetings in Dusty Lane, finished it off, and tied a bow around it. And so. But you did start it, so thank you. thanks to him. Mm -hmm. Thanks to all of, all of the committee. Sorry, John, if you don't okay. mind. Oh, that's right. fine. That was, a good, right. that was a good point to make that comment. The, the other, really the other point I would make is the review committee uh, will review a project plan and uh, in the most normal scenario, in this case, you actually had the review committee create the project plan. So this is truly a bottom-up type project. And so the presentation that you will hear from the committee members tonight is something that we've actually asked them to put together. You find the area, they've come back with, with recommendations and a and a plan that they think will work. Uh, once it passes the review committee, it goes to the planning commission for purposes of, of determining whether the project plan is consistent with the comprehensive plan. That happened last week uh, on Tuesday, the 1st of March, and the planning commission held a, a hearing and determined after that hearing that uh, this plan was consistent with the comprehensive plan. And now it's come to you, and you'll have two hearings. The first one, the one tonight, is a hearing where you're going to basically hear this presentation about what the project is, and then the microphone is open for the public to come and ask questions about the project. So it's a, basically a question and answer session. Uh, when you conclude the hearing tonight, you'll have a second hearing on the 21st of March, and that will be a more traditional public hearing, and that is when members of the public can come forward and basically express their uh, opinion as to whether this uh, district is a good idea or not. And then after you've concluded that hearing, you have the ability to uh, adopt an ordinance that would create the TIF district if, if you choose to go forward with it. And so with that, I'll, I'll shut up. <laughs> is the next public hearing, so the second public hearing, is that March 21st? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay, well, I've lost my spot. Uh, <laughs> at the, uh, are we ready for I believe, the presentation? Uh, the of the committee, Mr. Bartley and Mr. Yeah. Bass will okay. lighten you. So would the committee you. please come forward? <laughs> well, I'm not the entire committee, but I do appreciate the opportunity to address Mayor Noble and the council regarding the 6th Avenue District and the potential for economic development on that side of town. Part of what we really are looking at trying to do is in this time of developing new businesses to be able to provide uh, the fundamental structure for you folks to make decisions on individual projects as they come forward. Um, part of it is uh, hearing or at least being uh, aware of the comprehensive plan and making sure that what we did fit into the comprehensive plan. Uh, much thanks goes to Dusty Lane for his participation on the committee because he was able to give us a lot of guidance uh, regarding land use. Uh, nothing that is proposed in this does anything about changing zoning uh, or anything of that magnitude. This is really talking about trying to draw businesses. As the first part of this, and I'm going to skip over this map because I think this one's a little bit better, I want to bring your attention to the areas that we're talking about. Specifically, we're talking about 6th Avenue uh, all the way uh, from, Range, uh, from Range Road all the way back into town to the east toward Sanger Road. 
Uh, you'll notice the areas that would be covered by this particular district in the pink in this particular diagram. Um, I would like to, when council originally presented this to us, they also asked us to look at areas of the city that were west of Grange Road. You'll see that in pink on the far left of the diagram here. We did consider those areas, but uh, per council's request, we really looked into it and determined that, uh, first of all, the area that is outside, or if you will, west of Range Road, uh, required significant up update to the infrastructure to be able to provide for those locations. And then in addition, we were mainly concerned about infill with regards to the areas which already have some commercial development, specifically the areas, again, from uh, Sanger Road out to Range Road. Are there any questions about the area of the size of the district that we're talking about? I'll go forward then. This TIF district, as what is proposed here, is simply to provide help to the council and also to SETI economic developers. Uh, it, it should be viewed as a framework. I, I uh, being a layman, I always like to say it, it allows us to dot the I's and cross the T's in anticipation of individual projects coming to us. All the projects that would be involved in this TIF in the future would be individually reviewed by the council, either yourselves or whoever are council members at that time, and then they would be approved by that individual project, not necessarily any kind of blanket project, but this gives you the framework for that. Uh, the project plan that we're proposing here does not obligate the city at all. Um, it outlines the parameters for city staff, economic growth advocates such as the Chamber of Commerce and potential developers to be able to see that this is an area where the city is encouraging economic development. Um, the goal here is really to try to help you in the future to avoid what I would call a fire drill when some kind of opportunity arises in that we have a framework available. In addition, it also allows you to have um, assets that the city staff and again economic development folks can use in talking to potential developers about areas that they might be interested in. How it works is not up there. There we go. Ah, thank you. Okay, when we talk about it, you have, as I said, individual projects that would come forward. Each project would be re reviewed and approved independently. Uh, the development would then be built. Uh, whatever that might be, be it a restaurant, be it some sort of retail development of great magnitude. And after that development is open and the sales are made, then sales tax is obviously collected by the city. In the proposal that we have forward, the sales tax obviously that we collect today is 3.5%, and the city would be allowed to reimburse up to 1% for the project for a time frame agreed to in the individual project. As an example, the city might say, well, this project we feel is only viable up to a half a percent, and we only want to rebate that for 10 years, or we want to rebate that for five years at 1%. The city has the flexibility under this plan to do that, so this provides, again, that outside framework for that. The city would retain, in the maximum case of, uh, situation, 2.5%, and uh, after the full reimbursement, the city would retain 3.5%. You'll notice that here in this example, or here in this particular TIF, we are not proposing any kind of change to ad valorem taxes. Uh, the city retains the 2.5% and that 3.5% would go thereafter in the future. And with that, uh, any questions of me? Then I will turn it over to my, the esteemed colleague, John Bartley, and he will go over the ramifications. Mayor, Councilors, my name is John Bartley, and I was uh, very honored to be able to serve on the TIF Review Committee. And where we want, what we want to discuss next is really the, the what ifs, the what are the potential impacts if a TIF district was put into place and if a future council did approve an individual project plan. And so there's a, there's a, a, a very generalized example on the screen that's saying if a new development occurs, and a store opened that had a million dollars in sales tax in a year. And just to give a little framework, a million dollars in, in sales is approximately the size of a store on Main Street right now. So this is not a large big box, that is the example. If there are a million dollars in new sales, the city of Stillwater would collect 3.5% of that being $35,000 a year. If the agreement that was entered into 
called for a 1% rebate for a period of time, 10,000 of that would be paid to the developer for reimbursement for the public improvements, and the city would collect 25,000 in that first year. Now, as you know, $25,000 a year in new sales tax can go a long way. Our budget for the city is mainly based on sales tax revenue. $25,000 is a new playground. It's half a police car. This type of a development and this type of sales tax growth is extremely reasonable for just one store. The development that is po the development potential in this area takes it well beyond this very simple example. <clears throat> now, when Mr. Dorman spoke and uh, Mr. Bass spoke, we we are specifically the recommendation does not touch ad valorem tax. This TIF district has nothing to do with ad valorem or real property tax. This TIF is not touching property tax going to schools. It's not touching the property tax going to VOTEC. It's also not looking at the sales tax that would be going to the county. It is simply the city's portion of the sales tax. But we need to look at other benefits that a TIF could create beyond the sales tax benefit to the city. Right now, ad valorem tax or property tax, approximately 80% goes to schools and VOTEC, 10% to the county and on down the list. Why am I bringing this up? Because in the 200 and, let me find my notes, in the 278 acres in the TIF district, 117 of those acres are vacant right now. 135 are developed and 26 are underdeveloped. So a little less than half of the total acreage is undeveloped, meaning that the property tax being assessed and collected right now is extremely low. If that property is developed, the property tax that would be collected will skyrocket. And as an example, I want you to think of two different places, specific places in our city. I want you to think of the southwest corner of 6th and Country Club. This is a 40-acre undeveloped tract in this proposed TIF district. And now I want you to think about the Lakeview Point Shopping Center at Lakeview and Perkins Road. Not even counting the out parcels, the restaurants and the, the banks along the Perkins Road side, but just the shopping center. It covers approximately 12 to 15 acres. 40 acres undeveloped compared to 15 acres developed. Right now, the 40 acres undeveloped is $90 a year in ad valorem tax. The 15-ish acres that is developed, $263,000 in property tax. This kind of development will produce an unbelievable benefit to our school system through the increase in property taxes. And we haven't even started touching the personal property tax that these type of stores that would generate and would also benefit our public schools, our county, and our city. Benefits of the TIF. Now, you guys all, all know me and you know how I like analogies and I like stories. We've got to look at every TIF individually. No two TIFs are gonna be the exact same. How I would describe this is, if I were to say, let's go get a steak dinner. Now the mayor may think a prime rib and a baked potato. Actually, she'd probably want a salad, but go with me on this, mayor. Whereas I thought a filet and green beans. Both steak dinners, but completely different. Same with TIF districts. Every TIF district is unique. The recommendation that will be made is unique to this area to accomplish the needs that this area has. There are benefits. It is simply another tool in your toolbox and in future councils' toolboxes. It does not handcuff future councils into having to take action. The city council will always have the ability to say yes or no based on the situation at that time. That's Other an, benefits? That's an important point because I remember on the first TIF, there was a certain amount of, I'll just say pressure. There was time sensitivity and we were, I don't want to say rush because we <coughs> did, we were deliberate. But with this TIF, we were able to take as long as we needed and have as many meetings and, with no developer in mind. 
it's, it's all about that developer that might come along. So uh, I think we had a better process here than what we had before, just simply because the circumstances were vastly different. Very true. Another element in this TIF district that is established is it's based on future councils looking at a return on investment mindset. What kind of investment is the city, would the city be making? How long would it take to recoup that investment? And the flexibility is there for a large investment or a small investment, depending on the type of product, depending on the benefits that a development would return to the city at that time. Short version, this TIF is talking about a short-term use of one penny of our sales tax and a long-term three and a half cent collection of that sales tax. So short-term use up to a penny? Up or to a penny. Up to a penny, okay. It is, it, it, uh, if there was a, a handcuff that occurred from this recommendation, it was a cap of 1% but anything from zero to 1% is what this TIF would, would allow as part of the framework. So with, with that, I, I am open for more questions, Mayor. Okay, so I will address this to anybody on the committee. So I would it, like to uh, add that uh, go Roger right Ghost was not this quiet in the committee meeting. <laughs> <laughs> the night is young, Councillor Weaver, the night is young. <laughs> So let's say that we something, a developer comes and proposes a restaurant. What I'm hearing you say is we don't have to do this if we don't want to. We can consider it, but turn it down. Am I correct? So yeah, I'm going to turn this one over to Mr. Bass. He, he was our retailer. He has a retail establishment that's right in the middle of this TIF district. And his experience and knowledge and insight into retail was extremely valuable during our considerations. And there was a lot of conversation about competition, leakage, cannibalization, all those type of things. And so, Mr. Bass. Thank you. Would you mind restating the question? My own biography was stunning to me. <laughs> <laughs> I was asking if, uh, from what I hear, you, you are giving counsel, now and in the future, anytime a developer comes to us and says, I want to do this on this piece of land and I want up to this much, we don't have to agree to anything. This that is absolutely correct. The, the, the beauty of this is that when you're fostering initial discussions with the developer, you can say that within this district, we have the ability and the approval to look at the project from the standpoint of potential TIF. Okay, so if certain things came that we thought didn't need in to be part of a TIF, they could, could they develop there without being part of the district? Absolutely. Absolutely. This okay. is not to restrict development, it's more to encourage. To encourage. So it's open for anybody. It's up to us if we incentivize. There are certain restrictions that we, we have recommended to the council on the TIF, including uh, certain types of adult businesses and things of that nature that we felt like should be incorporated into the framework, as I said. Uh, but certainly council could could take a look at something that is within that uh, or is outside of that framework and approve it. Okay. So in this case, the developer would have to come in and say specifically what he or she might be proposing for that site, the specific mm -hmm. business or not. Mm -hmm. And we would have the ability to say yes or no, or negotiate the sales tax based on what <coughs> we would see the return to be. So the, the council would fully control all aspects of the deal. Which is different than our, than our one and only right. TIF district. Um, I think, you know, you learn as you go along, and it seems that we've applied, this committee has applied different rules based on what we liked and uh, weren't as fond of in the last one. Well, part of what we looked at, I might add, is that there are other TIFs of similar nature throughout the state of Oklahoma that have been very successful in developing um, very large retail uh, 
uh, developments. Tulsa Hills is an example. In the Jinx area, if any of you have been there, it's a stunning retail development, and that all is provided through a TIF uh, that is a joint between Jinx County School or Jinx Schools and Jinx City. Um, our view was that the ad valorem taxes were not a part of what we considered to be our charter. And uh, certainly, if something were big enough and magnanimous enough, it could be that the county is brought into it and so forth. But from our perspective, this has been successfully used both in Jinx and also in Lawton, Broken Arrow, and other areas. And we felt like that it would be a good thing to have for the city of Stillwater to be able to encourage development. Well, I think as we're looking on the southwest side of town and wanting to get that developed, we want to make sure it's the right kind of businesses and the right and not just, you know, uh, a haphazard thought process. So I appreciate the time and effort you guys put into this committee to do this because I think it's vital that we, if we're going to develop this undeveloped land, that it's done in a thoughtful way and with That's businesses it. that make it successful. You know, we, we can't control it completely if someone right. goes out and buys real estate and develops right. out there without coming to us, we, we can't control. Right. But this gives us a vehicle to try to manage events and development out there yep. in a way that we think is complementary to the city. Yep. But if somebody goes and buys, you know, yep. a piece of dirt and wants to put another car dealership out there, we can't control right. that. Well, I might mention something else that's a part of this TIF as well, and that is, is the concept of redevelopment. Uh, let's say for the sake of argument for some reason that Walmart would elect to leave uh, their west location, we'd have a very large building, empty building, empty lot, and we can also help in the redevelopment of that particular area. So we considered also down the road, uh, 15, 20 years, what might happen uh, with property that is currently developed and currently doing very well but may fall into disrepair. Any more qu questions, counselors? I would like to say thank you very much to the committee for your time and your effort and your lively discussions. Is that how you described it? Uh, yeah, that's, okay. that's the public way. Of oh, <laughs> Councillor Darlington, I, I or don't Vice have Mayor an, Darlington. I don't have another question. I, d I also wanted to say thank you. It just has mm -hmm. a totally different tone. Um, mm -hmm. It feels like the, the city is looking ahead, and I appreciate your um, um, thoughts about infill and the extraordinary e extra um, infrastructure that we'd have to put in other places. So <clears throat> this focus really sounds good. Thank you. I have to open the floor for the public. So now I would like to open the floor for the public for questions tonight, comments March 21st. Yes. Okay. Would anyone like to ask a question? Please, please come forward and introduce I'm your... I'm Killam. I'm okay. a longtime Stillwater resident, and I also made every committee meeting but two, although I wasn't a part of this committee. We keep hearing about new sales tax here. Where is the breakdown of what's new sales tax and what's being taken from other existing businesses? Because that's a huge thing because... There are a lot of businesses who've been established in Stillwater for a long period of time who now are going to be competing with someone who's being incented to be there, and it seems a little imbalanced. So when we talk about new sales tax, how much is new? Good question. Yeah, good question. And uh, Well, I, you know, I'll, I'll help. I, okay. Uh, I can't tell you how much would be new and I can't tell you how much would be cannibalized. There would certainly be a gain should the project that's approved be seen as complementary or bringing something new. I wouldn't want to put uh, something into the community that's not a good fit or that obviously competes in a way that isn't complementary. You know, we've grown sales tax from you know, about $8 million in just a few short years, and I think a lot of that has been due to the development that we've done downtown and in other places in the community. Uh, any of the other committee members have a comment on it? I mean, we talked about this a lot. We, we can't, I thought we were going to take questions. Can we discuss it? Yeah. Oh. We'll discuss. oh, okay. Uh, I would add, can I add one point too? Yeah. Uh, and that is the <coughs> difference of whether it's new sales tax or old sales tax will depend on the development itself. 
And so until you have a specific development, it's hard to make that determination. But there are certainly ways that you can make that finding. One is to look at existing sales tax receipts from existing businesses and see if, that, if there is a decrease in, in sales tax collections from that location. Uh, that's one way to determine it. Uh, if you, I mean, some cities just take a, a flat percentage. War, for example, takes, makes an assumption that there's going to be about a 10% leakage from existing businesses. So right off the top, they, they remove that from any type of incentive program. But it will depend on the specific project. So a project it, could be approved by the council that won't increase sales tax by the nature of the project if a council were so inclined to approve it. And if it didn't increase sales tax, there wouldn't be anything to incentivize, if you think about it in those terms, because the way this one is written anyways, they must produce to receive any kind of incentive. It's all on the back end. And if you don't produce sales tax, and a new sales tax, and you don't produce uh, a margin that can be identified, then there's there won't be no collection. You know, a project that uh, the former mayor and I disagree on, but I think is an example of Point, and that was the Olive Garden project. There was many in the community that thought Da Vinci's was going to get killed. Da Vinci's is booming. They're doing great with an Olive Garden in their front yard. And that has increased sales tax. They're doing well now because when people pull into Olive Garden and they, they circle that parking lot, well, let's just go over to Da Vinci's and the other way around. I mean, the restaurants where Mexico Joe's are and uh, the, the properties that you own, there have been other restaurants that have built around you because it's the research shows that that sort of activity builds the base. It doesn't cannibalize the base. Just as a point of um, contention, I guess, there was a, an Italian restaurant on Hall of Fame that closed for over a year, and so the city lost 3.5% of every, do, every, every dollar that they would have generated so well don't make me <laughs> so don't make me go there <laughs> da vinci's food no, was wherever better. you want to go <laughs> <laughs> well let me make sure that the council is is aware um charleston's was talked about we need a charleston's in town that would be fantastic so i agree but why would we want to give one percent of their sales to the developer why would I charleston's don't. come if they wanted to come they already operate three businesses in town so they know what the market's like. If they thought there was a demand for it, they would be here. Well, the committee was thinking that if we can control the development, provide that infill to develop 51 out there going west, and by providing incentive, that development happens faster instead of whenever, it builds our community and it would increase our sales tax base. That's the whole point. Yeah, I, I'm not sure what our hurry is to develop that area. Why, why the city feels like they're the ones who need to determine, let's go out and make sure that the west side of Stillwater develops. Well, as, as one counselor, businesses. that's the thing I hear the most is we need restaurants on the west side of town. Do you hear that from restaurateurs? I hear it from people that live in the community. So restaurateurs are not listening to the sure. public and the demand. So again, a difference of opinion. Yeah. That, that's fine. I, I appreciate that. What I like about this as opposed to the last TIF that we voted on is we are in control in a different way. So I understand what you're saying. I understand what the committee's saying and uh, we have a different way to vote. So perfect. Well, thank you. I appreciate mm -hmm. your time. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you, Mr. Killam. Is there a way, and I, you know, I know, I guess Angela may be Microphone. Able to, oh, sorry. I'm relaxing back here. I, I, I know, and I, John, I know we've spoken before, and it's a concern, and I've thought a lot about it. Can we figure out our restaurant leakage? I mean, because I, I do think, you know, that's, we don't want to put you in a bad spot and, and make you think that we're trying to go against Stan Clark for all he's done to our community, but, I mean, there's got to be some numbers out there that when we look at this and a restaurant comes to us say charleston's we can say look these this amount of dollars went to wherever so i, I feel like his point is very well taken but I, I also feel like there's probably some evidence out there that we can discuss your point so you don't feel like we're trampling on 
Joes and Mexico Joes and Mojos. Good evening, Angela McLaughlin, Economic Development Director for the City of Stillwater. And to answer your question, yes, we actually um, have a company that we use called Retail Strategies. We approved that contract two years ago. That's where we get all the leakage reports. They update that for us every year. So when you hear me on public radio or out in the public speaking about the leakage that we have, it's something that we look at. Um, It's one of the things, for instance, fast food, we don't have a lot of leakage there. So we wouldn't go out and court if that's the word you want to use. Um, we wouldn't go and really talk to those restaurants because we know that we have quite a few and Stillwater seems to be a very good market for that. Um, and also, Mr. Dorman addressed um, how we look at um, the recirculation of those dollars. We would consider that or we brought it when we bring it to the city council. If a developer was asking for a certain amount, we would probably immediately take that down by a certain amount also to factor in that we're going to be recirculating some dollars um, in the community. Any other questions for me? Thank you. Follow up. Thank you, Angela. Follow up <coughs> question, Mr. Killam. I find leakage to be a very difficult thing for someone to be able to measure for restaurants. Has anybody here been to a Thunder game and eaten out of town? Oh, that's leakage. Oh, well, what if you go down to a sporting event in Oklahoma City and you eat? Oh, that's leakage. Please keep that in mind. Anybody else? These are all good things to think about. Yes, sir. Uh, Please state your name. Yes, my name is Robert Roth. I live at 4720 West 8th Avenue, which is in the Park Meadow. (laughs) And when this thing came out in the paper, we just need a clarification. I don't. I can only speak for myself. The other people here, we've not really discussed it at all. Uh, I don't think we have any opposition to the development in the area at all. In fact, we'd love to have more restaurants. But when this thing came out in the paper, my heart skipped a beat. Because once before, we spoke before this council, when we, we're residents in that Park Meadows area there, and we're pre-Walmart, we're pre all of the, the hotels and everything, and, and speaking over for, only for myself, have, have no opposition to those. They're, you know, those are lovely. They keep the, their grounds up and everything else. But we have a detention area to the north of our addition and to the east, it's a drainage. What happened almost happened before, and we got exactly five days' notice before the first meeting that they were going to fill that detention area in, and it's supposed to be part of the uh, flood control deal or for runoff, and they were going to put in culverts, like much on the order of what they did north of Boone Pickens, you know, when they. Mm -hmm. So that would handle the drainage. But they, were, they had plans at one time to put a kind of a strip mall thing right up to, back up to our property. And I believe, as I recall, it was 35 feet from our back fence. Something on that order, wasn't it, Paula? And I think it was to be two stories, okay? Commercial, I mean, uh, businesses on the bottom level and like offices and stuff on the top, and I only, ask you, how would you like to have a property that backed up to that, 35 feet from you? You couldn't enjoy your patio. You couldn't do a thing. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And I always had terrible visions that right behind my house, we would get a uh, Indian restaurant with an exhaust fan that would blow (laughs) curry in my backyard. (laughs) 24th heaven. (laughs) <laughs> so this isn't something, we're not here to rant and rave about the development, you know, and I understand people that have those concerns, of course, but uh, we just wanted a clarification there, and I, it kind of looks like on this drawing that those two areas aren't drawn in there, but we just wanted to have some assurance that, in fact, that's true, because, boy, when you see that, I mean, my blood pressure gets <laughs> sky high. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. 
I spoke too soon, Mayor. <laughs> I yep, said the night was young. On my hands. <laughs> <coughs> Mr. Roth is talking about this RT right here. See that yellow, yellow area right there? Mm -hmm. And it is not in the TIF boundary. It'll be south of the Holiday Inn Express. It's on the south side of that back road into Walmart, and it's not in the boundary. I think I'm probably just gonna say one thing too. As being a former business owner, um, in town and, and um, certainly had people comment we'd love to have something like this on the west side of town I wasn't part of the first TIF process I'm learning with this one with the committee I think what I like about this is it speaks to the fact that we actually can listen to what the project's going to be and see whether or not it's not them dictating to us that they'd like to have it it's us deciding whether or not we think it's a good fit for Stillwater and to me that feels a lot better than having to feel like I need to give an incentive for someone because you're right, some places are going to come whether we do an incentive or not. So. Thank you, Councillor. Anybody else? All right, so I'm going to close the public. Am I calling this a hearing? Uh, public hearing. Public hearing. All right. And where do we go from here? Do we hear from staff? What do we do about Nothing. this one? Was Nothing. Was okay. On okay, Bye. so we will go to eight general orders because the uh, form based code was dismissed. Am I correct on that? Yes. Okay. There's no re there's no rescheduling okay. of that in the call. All right. It's Once again, thank you to the committee. And Rob Hill will make a presentation on natural disaster. And also, thank you to everybody who came to speak tonight about this. Uh, we, we want to listen to everybody. All right, National Natural Disaster Preparedness, Mr. McNichol. Rob Hill will make that presentation. Right. Thank you. Rob Hill, Emergency Management. Before we get started, do you guys need a break? Yeah. Anybody? Mayor, counselors? No. We're good. All right, very Don't good. Don't take that. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like that's nope. all okay. <coughs> Do we? Are we going to need a break? Uh, no, you no, won't need a break. See. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> and how appropriate we're uh, we're talking about uh, disaster preparedness in the month of March, which is National Disaster Preparedness Month. So we've transitioned from winter time. We've been fighting wildfires a little bit. Now then we're looking at severe weather seasons, so how appropriate that we would be looking at uh, um, reviewing our plans and going through what we do every day and, and looking at what we do for the community. Um, we take this time of the, of the year in March to reach out to our businesses, our homeowners, um, college students, um, everybody that we can think of, industries, businesses, and we asked them to review their plans, their safety plans, their business continuity plans. What are they gonna do if we do have a disaster? What are, we gonna do, what are they gonna do um, if they have a tornado or a major earthquake that, that proves to be damaging, that puts them out of business for a little bit? So that's what we do this, this, type of the, or this time of the year in, in the month of uh, March. And the city's no different. Every quarter, we review some portion of our emergency operations plan we go through it, we look at it, we make sure it still fits the needs for the response of the city, we make sure it still fits the needs and the response for the community in which we serve. <clears throat> um, one of the things that we try to bring awareness to are the very simple things. We want things to be very easy. We want people to review their fire drill plans in their homes, review their, their severe weather safety plans in their homes. And as of recently, now then we've included and we started to emphasize earthquakes. We need people to know what to do uh, in the event of an earthquake. Um, for example, and, and I'll be very brief on this, protecting yourself from an earthquake in a severe weather event is pretty much the same thing. In severe weather, we want you to get inside, get down, and cover up. For an earthquake, we want you to get down, cover up, and hold on, because it's implied that everything that you're hiding under is possibly going to move. So they're the same. So we actually treat the response from the city in much the same manner. So <clears throat> um, the other thing that we emphasize is a lot of people want to talk about um, the differences between safety. 
the severe weather safety aspect. Underground is better, store, um, safe room is better, um, and then an interior room. One of the things that I would like to draw your attention to about that is when people say that though, I want you to know we haven't always had safe rooms and people have survived a lot of severe weather and a lot of different disasters um, in the uh, lowest level, most interior portions of their home. And, and that's one of the things that we reach out to the community with, make sure that they, that they know that. The other thing that we do is we do a lot of community outreach. We talk to civic groups, we talk to schools, we make presentations all the time in regards to severe weather. We talk about safety awareness. We talk about how to build plants. Um, we, it is the second most important thing that we do is to make sure that our community is resilient in, in the event that a disaster were to occur because not only are they going to have to recover from a disaster, but the city as well, and to be able to respond and provide the general services that we do on a daily basis. And in, uh, in an attempt to make the community more aware and, and to bring a, a much higher level of awareness to them, uh, Mayor reached out to us some time back and asked us to make some videos, some public safety announcement videos that would show people how to turn off the utility should their homes or their businesses um, be affected by a disaster. So um, I reached out to marketing and public relations. I've worked with Jasmine Siever for pretty much the better part of the last three months and with Sherry um, talking about the direction we want to go with this. And this evening, with your permission, I have two videos picked out that I would like to show you this evening that we're going to, um, after the <coughs> meeting, they're going to be put into the lineup and put on channel 14, our local cable access channel. Um, I will ask you, do you have a preference? I have four videos. I was intending to show you two, electric or water first. Which one? Uh, electric. Okay. Electric. All right. All right. I was going to say water, but okay. <laughs> All right. Well, you're the mayor. No, 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 no. I'm teasing. All right. Ooh, I like it already. Yeah, that's good stuff. Like the Hi, Stillwater. My name is Rob Hill, and I'm the emergency management director for the city of Stillwater. When a natural disaster occurs that causes structural damage to your home, shutting some of your utilities off may help keep you and your family safe and may prevent further damage to your home. In an event that you need to do this, the City of Stillwater wants you to know why it would be good to shut a utility service off, as well as how to do it and when the best time is to shut it off. You should have a main panel in your, could be located in your garage, it could be located in a hall, um, a closet, or in your utility room. This may also be located on the outside of your home. You simply open the panel, and you'll find the main breaker located at the top. This would be what you would trip and shut this off and this would open up all the power to your home. In the event that you did have damage to your home and you trip this off, uh, you would want to leave this off until you had, the, had an inspection on your wiring to make sure that you didn't have any frayed wires that could cause a short and cause a fire. All you gotta do is flip this off in this direction and I'm flipping it. Back on. The meter on the outside of the house does not need to be messed with. That needs to be left to the lineman or the electric utility to disconnect or work on any portion of that service. Thank you. Not all utility shutoffs are the same, and there are many differences in the shutoff locations depending on the type of residence you live in. If you can't find the shutoff to your utility, contact your local service provider and they'll be able to assist you. And remember, if you do shut off a utility service due to damage, don't restore it yourself. Call your local professional. Have a good day and stay safe, Stillwater. Exactly what people need to know. All right. And the next one will be the water. And water, I, I might point out, <clears throat> not only are these good to know after a disaster, but they're good for every day. If, if people are doing things at their home they have questions about. We have a lot of students that live in this community, obviously, and they don't even know how to turn, off, turn the power off to their homes. So we found that uh, these videos serve dual purposes. Hi, 
Hinesdale Water. My name is Rob Neal, and I'm the emergency no, management director. It's the same the intro, the same outro <laughs> in every video. <laughs> Should have done an outfit change. Yeah, home. there you go. Shaving <laughs> some of your utilities off may help keep you and your family safe. If you only knew how hard it was to record to this. <laughs> in the event that you need to do this, the city of Stillwater wants you to know why it would be good to shut a utility service off, as well as how to do it and when the best time is to shut it off. Your typical water meter that needs to be accessed by the water department will be a little bit larger than a customer valve size. We'll talk about customer valve size really quick. The water meter that needs to be addressed by the water department is larger, black in color, and actually takes a special key to unlock. It turns and then pulls off. In an instant that you do not have a customer side valve, you will need to call the water department to have this locking lid removed to turn the water off. On the other side, you can also request a customer valve from the city of Stillwater. There is no cost to the customer whatsoever. You can go to any of your local hardware stores and purchase a tool similar to this. This tool has a U-shaped end on it that you can stick down in here, and you can locate the customer side valve and turn it a quarter turn clockwise to turn your water off, and then turn it back a quarter turn to turn your water back on. This There's one other option valve. that you can't have, mm -hmm. and that's just to make sure that you have a master valve in your house. And we'll go inside and see if this house that we're at does have a master valve. And as we can see here, this home does have a shut off located in the water heater cabinet. If you don't have these two options available to you, a shut off valve in your house or a customer service side valve outside by your meter, we do ask that you call the customer service department and the water utility so we can come out and shut your service off at the meter. We will also come out and turn it back on once the service has been restored or the problems have been fixed. Not all utility shutoffs are the same, and there are many differences in the shutoff locations depending on the type of residence you live in. If you can't find the shutoff to your utility, contact your local service provider and they'll be able to assist you. And remember, if you do shut off a utility service due to damage, don't restore it yourself. Call your local professional. Have a good day and stay safe, Stillwater. I will tell you, uh, we did a natural gas. Um, it is in the past always growing up. We've always turned our gas off if we needed to turn it off to make a repair to do something, but we reached out to the Oklahoma Natural Gas Company and asked them to come and do a presentation for us on their behalf so that we would convey their message. <coughs> we were unable to make that happen, but what we were allowed to do was take the information that they have on their web page and just basically state that information in a video. And I will tell you, uh, it is not recommended ever to turn off your natural gas. They tell us in the video, um, if you smell gas, leave your residence, leave the area immediately, and call from a safe location. Um, we also found out that in a disaster time, they will go and they will actually turn a master switch off, or a valve off, I should say, master uh, valve to a entire community area until they can go back through residence to residence, pressure them up and make sure that there's no leak. Um, the reason is earthquake, if the, if the foundation was to shift uh, in a tornado, if the, the meter was to be hit, it could fracture the line underneath and could cause a more serious problem by turning the valve off than if it was just remained on and turned off at a, at a master valve for a neighborhood. So we learned quite a bit and we were able to pass that along in these videos. Um, these videos will start in a series uh, this month, uh, immediately after uh, council meeting tonight. You guys got to see them first, and uh, it was very educational and very entertaining for Sherry's staff, let me tell you, in recording the <laughs> videos. So if you get a chance, I would encourage you to watch all of them, so I'm very proud. Rob, I think you did a great yeah. job, and this is such a good community service that, that takes two minutes of your time mm -hmm. to be able to watch. I know I had the, where do I turn off my gas, and where do I turn off my water now? I know, don't touch my gas and where to go. I, I'm thinking there might be a rush to find tools to turn off water. I don't know. <laughs> also, anyway. I might say, I might add, we did extensive searches on the internet to try to find other communities that had gone as far as what we have. And I will say this, 
we are pioneering in this area. <laughs> Still pioneering. Still pioneering. Yeah. Still pioneering. We're the leaders, and that's where we should be. So thank you. Thank you all. For making Appreciate us it. leaders. Thank you. And so, Mary, I also believe those uh, videos will be available on the website for access mm -hmm. as well. Okay, that takes us, Mr. McNichol, to item B, uh, the operating budget. Our chief financial officer, Melissa Reams, will pre make that presentation. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Good evening. That's a, that's a hard act to follow up, especially when you're <laughs> going to talk numbers and budget. <laughs> Just wanted to update you as to where we were in the development of our fiscal 17 budget. Uh, this is not very legible on this PowerPoint, but you were provided this high level overview of all our funding uh, in your packet for this week. And this is available on our website to anybody in the community. It's uh, the budget in brief. Not much has changed since we originally discussed the budget on January the 25th. Uh, we met with the public for a budget, open budget fair, and really got very little feedback on the budget from that uh, event. Personnel costs have been adjusted. Uh, our finance department worked very diligently to get those all calculated. In these projections, there are step increases that potentially could be awarded to employees who are uh, making that movement upward, but there are no across the board salary adjustments there. Uh, direct and indirect costs have been updated. Those costs had not been updated and looked at since uh, fiscal 13, and so the finance staff uh, looked at that and with some minor changes. And then the fund cash balances in all of our special revenue funds have been updated for a projection that we feel is more realistic as to what to expect as we get to the end of the year. Kind of some revenue analysis as we're building this budget, our sales tax remittances through February, and this is cash basis now, not accrual basis, 19473159 uh, That is down 1.18% from the same months a year ago. So just looking at totals through February and comparing. And then our budget to actual variance is a negative 6.46. In essence, that means that we have received less uh, for these eight months than what we had anticipated when we created our budget. Use tax, on the other hand, which uh, I find this interesting, is up. It is up 14.35% from this time last year, and it is actually, we have a positive budget variance in use tax. And again, use tax is, it's an in lieu of sales tax. It's for goods and services that are brought in that have not paid state of Oklahoma sales tax. Uh, lodging tax, the remittance through uh, February of 2016 is 496,045. That is down 9.77%, same time last year. And then we have a negative budget to actual variance. So again, we budgeted a little bit more than what we we're actually receiving at this point in time. Uh, Mr. Bartley's presentation on the TIF, I think, really emphasized for you or for all of us that we really live and die by sales and use tax. That is all that is really left to municipalities. Um, we don't get any ad valorem tax. Melissa, I know just briefly, our sales tax, although it's down, is nothing compared to the state's average. No, so we're no, doing, we're I good. Know, we, I know you came from the state, so I know you know. We, yeah, and in our situation, is different than the states. We're not as dependent on oil and gas, although that does, that did contribute a lot to some growth in those areas in prior years. Um, and we have, we have a really wonderful partner in this community that provides us a, a economic engine that chugs right along. So um, that being OSU. And so we are somewhat insulated. I don't want us to put our heads in the sand and think that we are not going to see some impact, I think we are. Capital improvements. We are so excited that we're gonna get that commuter air service here, but along with that opportunity comes some cost, opportunity cost. 
and there are some capital improvements and in, in fact uh, uh, Gary is going to come and visit with you about some of those improvements, but we are going to have to continue to make some significant investment in that airport so that it can be not only ready when August the 22nd comes, but that it can continue to improve and develop and become one of those premier commuter sites. We're also investing money in our infrastructure, in our streets. And I just wanted to list some <coughs> of the big projects that are underway. Our Western Road to Lakeview uh, improvement, Sixth and Perkins, Perkins from McElroy to Lakeview. Um, two of our bridges are in need of uh, rehab, so to speak, Husband Street Bridge and Third and Perkins Bridge, and then our pavement management program. And that is over and above all of these capital type projects. So with that in mind, these are the things that we are going to need to, we still have left to put into our budget, uh, police and fire compensation amount, <coughs> health insurance costs, and I did get an update from our HR director uh, late this afternoon that it does look like those costs are coming in here in the next couple of days. So I'm, I'm excited about that. Depending on where we end up with our revenue and our capital improvement projects, my, my guess is our general fund beginning cash balance is going to change. And more than likely it's going to drop. With that decrease, it one of the places we would see that change happen would be in the transfer from the SUA. Uh, another thing that we could do to mitigate that would be to come in and look again at our expenditures and see if there's any trimming we can do on those expenditures. And any kind of input from council and the public. There's still plenty of time to have that taken into account. And here's our timeline. Next uh, council meeting on the 21st, we're going to have our first of two public hearings. The second one will be on April the 4th. Uh, we're hoping that we can have a budget resolution and adoption on May 2nd, but if not, we've still got some play in our timeline. Um, I want to try and give the finance staff, if at all possible, the month of June to load that budget into the computer system. And we're going to try something new this year by, instead of rekeying all these numbers, we're going to load off of an Excel spreadsheet and upload it into the software. With the ease of that comes a lot of checking on the back side. And then we'll be ready to begin on July 1st with fiscal 17. Any questions that I can answer for you all? Help me again. General government, what is that? General government is, it, it's a broad umbrella that is not one specific department. Okay. It is somewhat akin to the city manager's office, okay. but yet it is, it's a little broader in nature. Um, trying to think what is in general government. Is that our? Maybe our health insurance is there because it services the mm -hmm. whole. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's a large, I mean. And self-insurance, I think, is in. in self-insurance. Is what that is. Self insurance okay. is part of it. Self and park insurance. I just couldn't remember. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Melissa. Thank you. Thank you. Item C Water 2040 package. Bill Millis. Package A, I should say. <laughs> Bill Millis will be providing that report. Good evening, counselors. Um, Bill Mills, Water Utilities Director, and Mayor, if you have a 30 second timer, I think I can beat it. <laughs> Actually, I do. <laughs> uh, I'm here tonight to ask you to pass a resolution of reimbursement associated with Water 2040 um, with our loan application. This is not an additional um, funding request for an additional loan. This applies to a portion of the package A loan for Water 2040. The resolution allows the city to be reimbursed from the loan funds for certain expenditures that would occur between 60 days prior to tonight and the loan closing. Um, no, and that, that's hard costs like real estate acquisition, um, potentially construction. The, uh, so at this point, there's no action necessary, but I do recommend when you get to the, uh, 
item of resolutions, one on the council agenda, one later on the SUA agenda, that you uh, pass those resolutions. Any questions? Councilors, any questions? That's 52 seconds. All right. <laughs> I appreciate your Both, brevity. Uh, <laughs> we appreciate right. it. Thank you. Thanks. The report was easy to follow. Too. That's right. Yes. Right. Thank yeah. you for yeah. the nice report. Yeah. Very good. That's why you don't have any questions. That's right. Yeah. See? All right. And that takes us to item D, summary of modifications to complete streets draft policy and multimodal transportation policy resolution CC-16-29. Mr. McNichol. And John McClenney will be providing that report and let's see if he can be as fast as Bill. <laughs> I don't think I can promise 30 seconds, <laughs> <laughs> but I'll try. Uh, at the February 22nd council meeting, we brought to the council the complete streets draft policy concept and recommended that it be put into the form of a resolution as a multimodal transportation policy resolution. And that is here tonight on the agenda. Uh, the action item will be taken at that point. Just wanted to let you know some things that were different between the draft policy and the resolution. We worked with the city attorney's office and combined some things that were either uh, similar, redundant, etc. We had uh, general exceptions and exclusions were in the draft and also some exceptions and exclusions for bicycles and pedestrians. So we combined those into one exclusion section. The exclusions that repeated such as there was an exclusion for cost in general and there was an exclusion for cost based on environmental impacts and things like that, we combined those to cover that general category of any any cost issues. Uh, language of the various items was put in general terms. We didn't specify bicycles, pedestrians, flying cars, autonomous vehicles. We made it all, all users of the transportation network. And then we made a distinction between the City of Stillwater standards and then guidelines that are published by various organizations, uh, federal transportation, etc so that the City of Stillwater standards that are adopted by ordinance are distinct from those other things. And uh, I can try to answer any questions if you have any, but the resolution is on the agenda later. And your recommendation for the resolution? Is to approve the resolution. <laughs> All right. Councilors, any questions? Yeah, would you, I wasn't sure I was following your very last statement. You're not saying City of Stillwater will have road and design standards that are different than the federal and state? We already have adopted by ordinance City of Stillwater design standards, and those are adopted by the city that apply to our roads. They're, they're uh, different in terms of the other guidelines that were in the policy because those are guidelines and standards as opposed to adopt, adopted uh, by city ordinance. But a lot of the things that are in those are be, will be similar to what's in our city standards. It would make sense to me, just like with building codes, where we try to comply with you know, national standards, we would comply with those as well. And we do, when possible. Okay. Okay. Anybody else, counselors? Thank you. Thanks. That takes us to item E, approval of engineering contract for runway. And the airport director, Gary Johnson, will be providing that information. Thank you, uh, Mayor and City Council. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here this evening. Uh, I'll call your attention to the report and attachment one and two uh, to the report. And uh, currently in the 2016 budget, we have been moving forward with a design only grant and the engineering for the parallel taxiway system for runway 17. That's part of our capital plan and part of our capital program for three years. Since the announcement of the airline service, and we know a specific start date now, we've been evaluating what will happen as we design that parallel taxiway and the impact it may have on the primary runway. And uh, part of that construction for the parallel taxiway is in what's called the runway safety area. And to work in that area, we would have to either close the runway or do the work at night. And that would be if we did that with the larger project. 
And uh, as we evaluated that and discussed this with FAA and Oklahoma Aeronautics Commission, uh, we, we looked at, is it possible to get this project done before our August 23rd start date with uh, scheduled airline service? Pretty tall uh, challenge, I'll tell you, to start from a no design, no plan for a project to uh, design, bid, and build in that short time frame. Our friends with Oklahoma Air Knox Commission and FAA have worked diligently with, uh, with city staff and the city, and uh, we have uh, put together a process that will do that in a timely manner, and that will get that work done, it looks like, well in advance of the airline start. And uh, that's requiring a lot of work on their part to get the money together. And, and right now they've identified approximately $600,000 that they're targeting for this project. And uh, we have moved quickly. Uh, would thank you for help with OSU long range planning and, uh, and uh, have uh, advertised for request for proposal and opened those proposals and selected an engineering firm to do the, what's addressed in the report as the connecting taxiways or stubs. And uh, we will need to do that very quickly including uh, uh, approval of this uh, tonight and uh, Oklahoma Aeronautics Commission approval on Thursday. I did list a couple of alternatives uh, for your consideration and uh, would be very pleased to answer any questions that you might have. So I saw uh, that if we, you know, we could take the runway down or we could do it at night but it's going to cost a lot more so i appreciate very much that we're not going that we're looking at cost savings so thank you yeah. other questions counselors okay so this is uh you have a recommendation on the Resolution tonight, you would like us to? Alternative number one is what we would like for you to uh, approve. Uh, alternative number one would be to move forward with the engineering contract and uh, uh, the design of the taxiway stubs. Alternative number two would be to deny that and, move, and wait until we would uh, engineer the greater project and uh, do the construction next year in 2017. Uh, I do recommend alternative one as our best alternative. Counselors? Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, that takes us to resolutions. Uh, we need to vote. Yeah. Motion to approve. Second. Second. Alternative one. Alternative one. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve alternative one. Please vote. While those votes are being tallied, if I may, Mayor, um, yes. I, I would like to express our gratefulness for our partnership with Oklahoma State University uh, in the form of uh, Vice President Weaver and uh, Gary Ridley, who, who without this would not have happened so quickly. and. Uh, we have Gary fitted in a, a Coast Guard life vest and floaties and anything else because he's got a lot to do between now and August 23rd and the help of uh, long range planning from OSU will be outstanding and uh, I understand. Um, but uh, uh, again, just a uh, notation of a great partnership. So, thank That's you. why we're a great team. Okay, so that resol uh, yeah, it passed five to zero. It passed five to zero. So you got your alternative one. That takes us to <clears throat> resolution 2016-7, a resolution notifying the public of the compiling and publishing of the code supplement number four to the code of the city of Stillwater. Mr. Dorman. 
per state statute, whenever the city publishes a supplement to the city code, we're required to uh, give notice via resolution, and that's uh, what the purpose of this is tonight, is to comply with that statute, and quite frankly, to tell the public that uh, the code is now current through the fall of 2015 in terms of uh, content. Very good. All right, counselors, discussion, or do we have a motion to approve? Motion to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve. Resolution number 2016-7, please vote. And that passes with a vote of five to zero. It moves us to item B, resolution 2016-9. A resolution to support a transportation alternatives program, TAP, application by Oklahoma State University for improvement of Boomer Creek Gateway area located at 423 West McElroy Road, Stillwater, Oklahoma, CC-16-28. Mr. Dorman. This is a simple resolution of support for an OSU transportation project. Counselors, discussion, or do we have a motion to approve? Motion to approve and comment that it looks beautiful. Yes. And there is a link on our website where you can take a look at the concept drawing. It really will improve the aesthetics of that area. We have a motion and a second to approve resolution number 2016-9. Please vote. And that resolution passes with a vote of five to zero. And I do want to add that it does uh, pretty up the place. So uh, we're, we're excited about that. Uh, we have item C, resolution 2016-10, a resolution stating the Stillwater Utilities Authority's intent to reimburse capital expenditures. Mr. Dorman. This is the item that Mr. Miller spoke of a minute ago. This will authorize the reimbursement of certain pre-bond expenditures through the use of bond proceeds. With approval. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve resolution 2016-10. Please vote. And that is approved with a vote of five to zero. That moves us to resolution 2016-11, a resolution adopting a multimodal transportation policy. Mr. Dorman. This is the resolution that Mr. McClinney just spoke of. This will adopt your multimodal transportation policy. You should have a copy of it. Counselors, discussion or motion to approve? Motion to approve. We have second. a motion and a second to approve resolution number 2016-11. Please vote. And that is also approved with a vote of five to zero. That moves us to ordinances on first reading. Mr. Dorman. Ordinance number 3336, an ordinance closing a portion of the right-of-way Ramsey Street adjacent to property address to 616 South Ramsey Street. Move the second reading. Second. We have a motion and a second to advance ordinance number 3336. Please vote. And ordinance number 3336 advances with a vote of five to zero. That takes us to the next ordinance, Mr. Dorman. On second reading, ordinance number 3334, an ordinance proposing amendment of Article 6 of the Stillwater City Charter by amending Section 61 Annual Elections, three year terms, election at large, nonpartisan elections, and providing submission thereof to the qualified voters of said city at the next general election. Councilors, discussion or a motion? Motion to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second to adopt. Ordinance number 3334, please vote. And that is passed with a vote of five to zero. Ordinance number 3335, Mr. Dorman. An ordinance proposing amendment of Article 6 of the Stillwater City Charter by amending Section 61, annual elections, three year term, election at large, nonpartisan elections, repealing Section 6 3, primary election time voting, who nominated or elected, et cetera, amending section 6-4, general election, time voting, who elected, and section 6-6, six, six, when primaries and general <coughs> elections are not held, providing for submission thereof to the qualified voters of said city at the next city general election. 
Councilors, do we have discussion or a motion to adopt? Motion to adopt. Second. We have a motion and a second to adopt ordinance number 3335. Please vote. Ordinance number 3335 is adopted with a vote of five to zero. That moves us to reports from officers and boards. Mr. Dorman. Two items tonight. Uh, request an executive session pursuant to 25 OS subsection 307B4 for the purpose of confidential communication regarding a pending workers' compensation claim filed by Morris German. It is my opinion that public disclosure of this matter will seriously impair the ability of the City Council to process this claim and or conduct an investigation and or to prosecute or defend any resulting litigation or proceeding in the public interest. Mm -hmm. Second item, request an executive session pursuant to 25 OS subsection 307B3 for the purpose of confidential communication regarding the purchase or appraisal of real property. Mr. McNichol. One item, Mayor. If you live in an area bounded by 4th and 6th Avenues, Walnut and Jefferson Streets, anticipate construction work the week of March 14th. Contractors will repair or replace items including pavement, sewer, service, connections, and cleanouts. This construction work is part of the warranty inspection period for the West College Sewer Replacement Project, a community development block grant project completed in 2014. Other news, counselors? I have, um, in response to the upcoming election season, we want to remind residents about city code regarding temporary signs, including a campaign signage. Temporary signs may not be placed on public property, such as city parks or any public structures. This includes traffic signs, utility poles, and bus shelters or right-of-ways along State Highway 51, 6th Avenue, and U.S. Highway 177 or Perkins Road. Vice Mayor? I, if you're uh, planning to stay in Stillwater, a staycation for spring break, uh, we are having a five parks and five days spring break challenge. Uh, you don't have to register, just show up. Activities begin at 11 a.m. each day and end at 12.30. That is obviously over the lunch hour. Bring your own lunch Monday through Thursday, but on Friday there will be a hot dog cookout party at Boomer Lake Park. For more information, go to the website or look on Facebook. Okay. The Any? Stillwater City Council has initiated a public awareness campaign on the law change and the dangers associated with texting while driving. If you or your organization wish, wishes to partner with the city on this, let one of us know or email news at stillwater.org. Also, the Stillwater Sister, Sister City Council is sponsoring the SCI Young Artists Authors Showcase. This year's theme is Peace Through People. To find out more, visit the Sister Cities Council webpage. And then, can you? I saw that email today about uh, McElroy or McElroy, however, however long you lived here. I know people call it different things, being closed from their country club to Lakeview. When does that start? How long will that? Actually, I think that was country club that yeah, would be closed from sorry. McElroy to Lakeview in four weeks, I and believe, starts, is what it says. And that starts next Monday. Okay. So and sure uh, uh, that, that is. I know that affects a lot of people. Yeah, although it's outside the city limits, uh, it will be closed and it is to hasten. The completion of that construction work. It's dangerous right now. That's probably smart that close it. Yeah. yeah. So. All right. So uh, I have news, or excuse me, I have radio in the morning. So if you were wondering if it's you, it's not. It's me. <laughs> and at this time. <laughs> time so. <laughs> Colin, give her a hard time. Anything else? Okay. I'm going to recess this meeting and go to our SUA meeting and then we'll come back and go into executive. I'm recessing and calling to order the Stillwater Utilities Authority March 7th meeting and motion trustees to motion to approve. Motion or, to approve consent docket. Okay. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the consent docket. Please vote. And the consent docket is approved I need one more vote. Is that me? with a <laughs> it was me <laughs> it is the consent document is approved with a vote of five to zero that takes us to the resolutions 
Resolution SUA-2016-2, a resolution stating the authority's intent to reimburse capital expenditures. Mr. Dorman. This is the same resolution you approved at the, on the city council agenda. Okay, so do, anything that we have to do? Or Other than just vote, just for, vote it. for it? Okay. Motion Needs, to approve a second. We have a motion and a second to approve resolution SUA-2016-2. Please vote. And that resolution is approved with a vote of five to zero. Reports from officers and boards, Mr. Dorman. Nothing to report, ma'am. Mr. McNichol. No items, Mayor. Trustees. Lauren, great job. It's looking great out there. I, I know some of us have had the opportunity to go yes. get a tour of the Energy Center, and we have, I went out and saw the engines come off, and it's looking great, and it seems like it's progressing, and hopefully done June 28th? June 30th. June 30th. Awesome. Great. I can attest, my dad does not use his iPhone until he's taking pictures of that site when we went on a visit. He shows everybody, so it was, it was wonderful. Yeah. Thank you very much. It is great. Is there uh, a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second to adjourn the March 7th at Daughter Utilities Authority meeting. Please vote. And. With a vote of five to zero at 7:34, the SUA is uh, is adjourned. We will, I will reconvene and go back to uh, executive set up. Uh, go back to City Council, Mr. Dorman. Do we need. We just need a a vote to go into executive. Do we have a motion? So moved. You have to vote. We needed, uh, did we get a second? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> Hold it down. I'm just waiting. <laughs> second. We have a motion and a second to move into executive session. Please vote. And <coughs> it is approved five to zero. We will move in and be out shortly, hopefully. Yeah. Hey, Rob, I, I was thinking, uh, Last year, we had an earthquake and a tornado warning. Whether you are shopping, dining, or doing business in Stillwater, we would like to take the opportunity to let you know about public parking in three areas around Stillwater, downtown Stillwater, Campus Corner, and the Strip on Washington Street. In these areas, many of the free city parking spots, mostly in the street, are timed. Time ranges from 30 minutes to 3 hours Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., and these spaces are not timed on weekends and city-recognized holidays. The purpose for these timed parking spots is to give everyone equal opportunity to a parking space, which is not only good for other people visiting these areas, but is a benefit to the businesses in these areas as well. Now, say for instance you are cited for overtime parking as you are inside a business. Well, instead of paying the $10 citation, you can easily bring it back to one of more than 200 businesses in these three areas to have the ticket validated. All you have to do is give them the ticket and that's it. They will take care of the rest. For more information about public parking spaces, the validation program, or tickets, call the Municipal Court at the City of Stillwater at 405-742-8255 or visit stillwater.org.
The earthquakes you see in movies are one thing, but real life is a completely different animal. Just because you can't predict an earthquake doesn't mean that you can't prepare for one. In the event of a real earthquake, you should drop, cover, and hold on. Visit ready.gov slash earthquake and practice what to do to keep you and your family safe in the event of a real earthquake. And you'll be seen as a hero by your family and your loved ones. Visit ready.gov slash earthquake today. Storm sirens in the city of Stillwater are for notifying people that are outdoors and away from radio or television that there's an emergency regarding severe weather. They do have multiple functions that we can activate them for, such as an air raid or a flood, but in the last several decades we've only used them for activating on tornado warnings. The storm sirens are located within the city limits of Stillwater. We placed them in a gridded pattern, and when we placed them, we tried to keep them no farther apart than one half mile from each other so that we could get good coverage. When we activate the storm sirens in Stillwater, we want you to take cover immediately. Take action to find safety, and then when you get to safety, find out what's going on. Okay, so if I hear one, do I run outside? No, do not run outside. We want you to take cover. Get inside, get down, and cover up. We want you to have a plan, and most importantly, practice that plan. Make sure everybody in your house knows that plan, and stay informed. Know what the weather's gonna do that day, if you're gonna go shopping, if you're going to a recreational facility, if you're gonna go swimming. Just have situational awareness about what's going on around you. true definition of hero and been a hero took a heroic effort every day we bring to our fans the world of sports we speak of heroes and heroism but there are days when sports matter little and heroes matter more these heroes don't hit walk-off homers or buzzer beating threes they simply made a plan for what to do when disaster strikes you never know when you might need to be the hero because you never know if today is the day before a natural disaster prepare plan be a hero visit ready.gov Here on Stillwater 360, we'll provide you news you need to know three days a week in 60 seconds about the city of Stillwater. This is your March 7th Stillwater 360. 